Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. First Peter chapter 4. We're continuing our core value series. We have three weeks left of this counting today. We have today and then two weeks after this. Next week is going to be on unity, and the week after that is going to be on worship. And we'll be closing out this 12-week series that we've been on. It's actually been 13 weeks because we took a break. But we'll be closing out this series and then moving on to really incredible things. All right, but today we're talking about spiritual gifts. This is one of our core values, and it's such a major core value of who we are that really whenever Bailey and I took the church, this was a big push of ours. Like we just want people to be equipped to be able to do the work of God in the church. That was just a big thing. We want people to feel empowered. We want every individual in this church family to feel empowered empowered to be able to do the work of God regardless of the presence of a leader or a pastor or a mentor or you know somebody else who could help you know urge you along we want you to feel empowered to the point where you're like even if I'm alone I'm going to do the work I'm going to do what I've been asked and called to do by God and today talking about spiritual gifts I just want to read this core value as we have it written on our website, as we have it written just for who we are, you should find it in your bulletin if you'd like to read along with me. But our, our core, value for, core value for spiritual gifts says, we strive to create a place where all varieties of spiritual gifts can manifest because we know that what God has given us does not belong to us, but to the body. How many have a bulletin with you? All right, why don't you read it out loud with me? Let's just say this together. We strive to create a place where all varieties of spiritual gifts can manifest because we know that what God has given us does not belong to us, but to the body. I want to ask you some questions this morning. These are rhetorical and for you to think about, all right? Do you have something to offer in terms of spiritual gifts. You as an individual, do you as a person have something to offer? I want you to think about that. If I were to ask you to answer me, what would you say? Yeah, right. I hope I hope you would say yeah. How many of you here have how many of you in here have something to offer? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Have you offered it? That's my question. <laughs> I'm getting into, this is not my business. <laughs> have you offered it? If you are offering it, are you still offering it? Or have you stopped? If you aren't offering it, why aren't you? What's stopping you? Now what I want you to do is I want you to look at the people around this room. I don't even have to say look at the person sitting next to you because everybody's sitting next to you in this place. But look at, at the people around the room. <clears throat> Can they benefit from something God has put within you? Are they? Difference between can they and are they. <clears throat> can each person in this room right now benefit from what God has put in you? The answer should be yes. But your answer might change for this one. Are they benefiting from what God has put inside of you? person sitting next to you, might be your family, person sitting in front of you, have they benefited from what God has put in you, and are they benefiting from it? If they aren't, then why aren't they? So that's, that's my question this morning, my big question. If we feel we have something to offer, and we know that we should offer what God has put inside of us to the people around us, are they benefiting? 
being blessed and are they benefiting from what God has put in us? And if not, why aren't they? What's going on there? What's the roadblock? So I want to read out of 1 Peter chapter 4 to hopefully hopefully encourage us in the direction this morning of becoming more aware of the importance of you using and giving away what God has put in us. Now, the other thing is that you may feel like, I know I have something to offer, I just don't know what it is. But we're going to talk about that too. <clears throat> Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. This says, as each one, everyone say each one, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, it is to do so, is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right. Look at verse 11 real quick. He says, whoever speaks. How many of you in here speak? Got some people not raising your hands. I think maybe you're not listening. How many of you in here listen? <laughs> All right. Everybody speaks, right? All right. How about this? It says, whoever serves. How many of you in here don't feel called to serve? Okay, good. Everyone feels called to serve then. So this is talking about everybody. Whoever speaks, whoever serves. Okay, well, look at this first part in verse 10. He says, as each one, say each one again. All right, each one means every pastor. <laughs> each one means every man. <laughs> I meant the gender man, not like mankind. <clears throat> Each one means every believer. Each one, every believer has received a special gift. You have received a special gift. Has anyone ever told you that you're special before? Hopefully it was in a good context. <laughs> you're just really special, you know? <laughs> okay, I want to talk about a special gift real quick. <clears throat> I love the way that Peter puts it because it's not... It's not like what Paul normally says, okay? Peter says a special gift. This, these words special gift actually come from the Greek word charisma, which is where you get the charismatic church. All right, here's, here's a little, little mind bender. Why isn't everybody charismatic if each one has been given charisma? Okay. I won't go for that one too. That's going to stop there. Um, <laughs> I don't think charismatic's a denomination. I think it's a responsibility. Okay. Just push that soapbox away before I keep going on it. A special gift. This is where we get the term charismatic, the Greek word charisma. This literally translates to extraordinary powers extraordinary powers. Everyone say extraordinary powers. All right. You must feel like a superhero right now. Because if you are a believer, the word says you have been given extraordinary powers. Like I'm thinking like Marvel or like Captain America, you know, or Iron Man. He didn't have powers. He's just rich. But <laughs> but you know, like extraordinary powers, that, like Superman. You should feel like a superhero this morning as I'm talking to you because this says, if you are a believer, if you are a believer, raise your hand if you're a believer, okay, if you're a believer, you've been given extraordinary powers. <clears throat> you ever, have you ever thought about like the superpower that you would want to have if you were a superhero? You are a superhero. That's the thing. You are a superhero because you've been given powers. You've been given superpowers, extraordinary powers. What does extraordinary mean? It means extraordinary. 
extraordinary. I don't mean more ordinary. Like, let's just see how much more ordinary, extraordinary we can get. No, this word extra doesn't mean to add more ordinary to it. It means to go beyond ordinary. It means to exceed ordinary, to go above ordinary. Extraordinary means remarkable. It means unusual. It means not normal. You're weird. Get over it. <laughs> You're abnormal. You're not usual. You're remarkable. You are. Why, why do we want to be like the world then? They're nothing to look at. We're the remarkable ones. We're the, we're, we're the ones who go above ordinary, right? Why would we ever want to look or sound or think or act like the world? That doesn't make sense. Also, why did we think things were ever supposed to be ordinary in the church? Like, you want to come to church and for it to feel normal. It's, well, then that's not going to be church. That's not going to be like the, like God's picture of the church. It's going to be abnormal. It's going to be weird. It's going to be unusual and it's going to be remarkable. That's what the church is supposed to look like. All right. No one should ever be able to walk through these doors and go, this is normal. <clears throat> That's what we want. No one should ever be able to say, yeah, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing unusual about that place. You want people to say you're weird. You want people to say you're unusual. You want them to say you're not ordinary. You're not normal. I want that. We want that. It's a good thing. Right? I don't need to be popular. I just need to be powerful. That's what we want in the church. Honestly, I think the moment things become ordinary in the church, the moment things become usual and normal, that's when we should start reevaluating things. <clears throat> The moment we start settling into some form of normalcy and we're seeing just the usual way of things, that's when we should start reevaluating. Well, what are we doing here? Is, is God still moving? Because if God moves, it's going to be extraordinary. God is not natural. He's supernatural. We talked about this on Wednesday. We've been going through the book of Acts. God is supernatural. He is beyond natural. He's more than natural. If you get more than natural in the natural, something weird is going to take place. Something abnormal is going to happen. Amen? I mean, how many, how many people you think walk into our church and go, this is normal? Not very often does that happen. I mean, especially when you're, you know, you're down the street from OBU. You just, like, stuff is bound to happen here, and people know it. I, and we're like Disney World, I guess. <laughs> now, I'm talking about how we want things to be abnormal. We want them to be unusual. And not too long ago, I talked about the Asbury Revival, the big worship event that happened there that went on for just a long time. And one of the things that I said about that is that you and I should see that as normal. But we're so amazed by it because we really don't see it as normal. We see it as abnormal. Why do we see it as abnormal? Because that's the way it's supposed to be. We should think about even that, our point of view. Now, if you don't feel like you saw it as abnormal, how did you respond to it? Did you feel like, oh, they, that, that, I need to go there. I need to go do, I need to go there and I need to go do that. That means you thought it was abnormal. If you thought it was normal, you'd be like, eh, we can do that here. That's the way it's supposed to be. Right? It wouldn't have been this amazing event. You'd have just been like, that's business as usual in the church. Right? But you can't deny the fact that a lot of us saw it as that's unusual. That's a rare occurrence, a rare event, right? Well, that should tell us something right there. Why? And it's, it's interesting because we celebrated the fact that it was unusual. Why did we celebrate the unusual? Because that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be remarkable. It's supposed to be unusual, not typical. Amen? 
All right. Everyone say this. I have extraordinary powers. Say this. I am a superhero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some of you are rolling your eyes at that, I know. Now, you might think, you might think this. I don't know if you do. You may think this when you leave. Not me. I can't do anything. I can't preach. I can't teach. I can't sing. I can't prophesy. I can't pray. All of that. Okay? First of all, God doesn't want you to do anything. He doesn't care if you can do something. He wants to know if you're willing to let him do something. Okay? Now, another thing we've been talking about in the book of Acts on Wednesday nights is something I've said over and over the last couple of weeks is the main character of the book of Acts is not the apostles, even though we refer to that book as the Acts of the Apostles, right? No, the main character is not the apostles. It should actually be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's what we should be calling it. <clears throat> he's, the, he's the main character. He's the power behind it. He's the source behind everything that happens, right? He didn't care when he showed up. He didn't care if the if the the apostles knew how to do something or could do something. He wanted to know if they were willing to let him do something. So if you feel like, I can't do anything, I'm not capable, I also want to tell you you're in a great place because God normally picks people who feel like they can't. You read about it all throughout the word. How many times did God approach somebody and say, I want you to go do this, and they said, I can't. He would pick people to speak who couldn't speak, He'd pick people to prophesy who couldn't prophesy. He'd pick people to lead who couldn't lead. He's all about that. So I want to tell you this morning, if you feel like you can't, you're in a great place. Now you just gotta, you just gotta open yourself up to not to be like, you know, I can't, I accept that. I'm not supposed to be able to because God is able. And that's what matters. Amen? All right. So let's continue to read this in 1 Peter 4. It says, each one has received a special gift. Each one, each believer has received extraordinary powers. Then he says, employ it. Everyone say, employ it. All right, your translation may not say that. Mine says, employ it. And I love it because what is an employee? It's somebody who works. If you're going to employ your special gift, you're going to give it a job. That's what this means. Employ it. Assign it to something. Assign it to somebody. Give it a job. Give it some responsibility. Employ your gift. So I'm asking you this morning, the gift that you feel like you've been given, if you are aware of it, have you employed it? Have you given it a job? Or is it sitting there collecting unemployment? I have a point with that, and we're going to come back to it, all right? Have you employed your gift, or is it sitting there collecting unemployment, an unemployment check? Not meaning to offend anybody who might be actually, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about your spiritual gift, all right? I'm going to come back to that because I do have a point to make. Each one, each believer has received extraordinary powers. Employ it, and then it says, he says, in serving one another. All right, let me point something out. It doesn't say employ it in serving the world. It doesn't say that. It says employ it in serving one another. Who's one another? The church, fellow believers. Employ it, give your special gift, give your extraordinary powers a job in serving the church. You feel like you weren't called to ministry in the church? You are. You're called to serve the body of Christ. And I don't mean the organization. I don't mean living word church. I mean the body of Christ. You're called to serve the body of Christ. Did you know that the Bible references the use of spiritual gifts within the church way more than it says use them outside the church. 
large, like if you look at the large scope of things, the word really mostly says your gifts are for the church. And we might think we need to go out there and get people healed, which we do. But have you healed people in the church yet? How's the church doing? I don't know. I'll call Josh and ask him. Right? The word really places a special emphasis on if you have something inside of you, it belongs in service to the church. There is something God has put within you that everyone in this room can benefit from and must benefit from. It's an inescapable truth if you are a believer. It is an inescapable responsibility. I don't want to say this, but I have to because it's the truth. I am obligated to serve you. How many in here don't like feeling obligated? It's too much pressure. I am obligated to serve you because God gave me something for that very purpose. And being a believer is not just about believing, and it's not just about receiving. When I receive something, when I receive Jesus, I receive a gift and an example. And in that example, it's an example that says, as a believer, I'm not just here to receive, I'm here to give. It's my job, and I'm going to say the D word, it's my duty. Now, how many of you in here have a job? How many of us have a job? How many of us have three jobs? (laughs) Okay, would you ever think, I don't have to go to work today if I don't want to. (laughs) Would you ever think that? I mean, some of you are like, yeah, I hate that place. (laughs) No, you're probably not going to think, I don't have to go to work if I don't want to. No, what are you thinking? I need to go to work. I'm going to get fired. My boss is going to take away my paycheck. I'm going to get paid less. You know, there are all kinds of consequences that come with, I'm not going to go to work today. But then you have the body of Christ going, I'm not going to go to work today. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. It's not, it's not, you know, complimenting of my schedule. You know? Why do we have those double standards? I'm not saying everybody does. I say we for those of us that do. But why, why do those double standards exist in the church at all? If, if I'm, if I'm not willing to give less than 100% to my secular job, why am I willing to give less than 100% to my spiritual job? If anything, it should be the other way around. Right? It could be, well, I, I need the money. Well, don't let money be the Lord of your life. Let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Back to that unemployment check. Here we go. Here's what happens. Whenever, and this is scriptural, I'll get into it in just a minute. Whenever a few of us decide we're going to employ our spiritual gifts in service to the church, and the rest of us decide I'm not going to do that, they don't need me, I don't have anything, I don't want to do it, I don't want to take the time, whatever it may be. Whenever part of the body of Christ commits himself to this, themselves to this, and the rest of the body of Christ decides we're not going to do that, it places more weight on those who are serving. It places more weight and more of a burden on those who are serving than on those who aren't. All right? It's like it gets shifted. All of that responsibility that the, this part of the body of Christ that says, no, we don't want to, all of that responsibility is shifting over to the others who are employing their gifts. What I'm saying and what I'm trying to get at here is if if the use of spiritual gifts in the church is not mutual, 
someone is going to end up empty. If the employment of spiritual gifts in the church is not mutual, somebody is going to end up empty and broken. If, if I serve you and you don't serve me, who gets filled and who's left empty? Who gets blessed and who's left without blessing? Right? If you serve me and I don't serve you, who's filled, who's empty? God gave the gifts to the church for mutual use, for mutual benefit. And it's not about getting even. It's not like, well, I, I served you, now you have to serve me. I'm waiting. It's not about being even. It's just about being responsible. It's about being responsible with what I have. Whenever it says here in verse 10, employ it in serving, it literally means mutual use. Mutual. It should be, and it's okay, even if it's out of obligation, it should be that if someone does something for you, you do something for them. It's polite, and it's okay even if it feels like obligation. That is where we're at, and that is who we are as believers. If you have something, what's the problem in giving it? Amen? So, I'm talking about unemployment because it's like, in a nation that celebrates or reinforces not working, which we kind of have, I'm just saying, what has happened? Inflation. Prices have gone up. More pressure put on those who are working. I'm not saying that everybody has to work. Please don't take this. I'm trying to use this as an example of how it works in the church. Okay? If you can't work or something like that, I totally understand. Um, or if you have other things. So please don't feel condemned for this. I'm using it as an example. So there, there are negative effects to pushing for people to not serve or to not work in a nation, in our country. The same thing happens in the body of Christ. There are negative effects. It causes those who do serve to give more, to make up for the lack. And you, you, you end up, at some point, you end up giving out of need rather than out of fullness. And that's a dangerous place to be. Are you with me? So let's remember that the body of Christ is not a socialist organization. <laughs> we work together. We serve each other. We do our part, whatever it may look like. Doesn't mean that you have to be up here. Doesn't mean that you have to be back there. We do our part with what we've been given. Any Spider-Man fans? With great power comes great responsibility. That's scriptural. It really is. To whom much is given, much is required. Right? All right. Now, speaking of responsibility, look back in verse 10 here. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards. Everyone say stewards. All right. You're going to employ it as in serving one another as good stewards. This Actually, we've talked about stewardship before and how it means that you're going to manage someone else's property. But this is actually very specific. This word, stewards, doesn't just mean you're managing someone else's property. It's actually very specific. It's a treasurer. What does a treasurer do? Treasurer manages the finances. All right? So what Peter is saying right here, he's calling every believer a treasurer. Every believer, a treasurer, a manager of finances. Whose finances are you managing? God's. <laughs> he has poured money into my bank account via spiritual gifts, right? That is his currency in the church, the gifts of the Spirit. And you think about it that way. Man, that's awesome. That means we're totally, completely filthy rich. We are. God's currency in the body of Christ 
is, are the gifts of the Spirit. Isn't that amazing? And he has put me, you and I both, in charge of managing that, those finances. Now, I, I can't help but feel that Peter was like referring back to the parable of the talents here. What happens? The, the, the boss leaves. And he leaves, he leaves town for a while and he leaves his, his property, his possessions, um, in the possession of his servants, right? He leaves and he leaves them, basically he leaves them money. And when he, he, he leaves three servants, he leaves one servant five talents, one servant two talents, and one servant one talent. When he comes back, he discovers that the one who had been given five turned it into ten, and the one who had been given two turned it into four, and the one who had been given one buried it. Okay, the one that he gave five to that made it ten, and the one that he gave two to that made it four, I just said two to, where's Regan? She loves two twos right now. Um, he gave the same reward to both of them. You've been faithful with little, I'll put you in charge of much. Same reward to the guy that had 10, same reward to the guy that had four. So it wasn't like, well, you made 10, so you're the best. Now, he ended up giving the one talent that wasn't used to the guy who had 10, but before that, he gives the 10 and the four the same reward. You're both going to be in charge of much. So it's not, he's not sitting there going, this is an example of God. I believe in the distribution of the gifts of the church. Now, Jesus was talking about, I think, something that was even a little more broad than that. But here Peter is probably referencing that parable whenever he says, we're going to be good treasurers. You're going to be good treasurers. He gives the same reward to the guy that made five more and the same reward to the guy that made two more. So he's not sitting there thinking, if you're doing more, I'm going to give you more. He's thinking, are you doing something? Just do something. Just do something. I guarantee you, if the guy who was given five only made one talent more, he would have still received the same reward. Because God's not thinking, he's not, he's not looking at, at quantity. He just wants us to do something. Just do something with what he has given us. Just do something with what I've put inside of you. It may just take five minutes. Sometimes you feel like a five-minute prayer isn't long enough and you feel judged after you're done. I should have prayed longer than that. It was something. God's not going up. There. You should have prayed ten minutes. Not five, Not only five. No, he's going, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. <laughs> This is how he is. But the guy that had one talent goes out and buries it, and what does he do? He casts him into outer darkness. It wasn't just like, oh, it's okay, try again next time. Like, we're talking, this is irrevocable. This is something that, that if God's put something in me, and I'm just letting it sit there, collect the, that unemployment, not doing anything with it, something's not going to go right for me. Something is going to happen. I can't just straight up say I'm going to hell because I don't, I don't believe that, but something is going to happen. But I will say this. Jesus makes it very clear that those who use their spiritual gifts for the glory of God, use their gifts for the glory of God, they will have a reward in heaven. He says that. No, I'm just like, you know, do, do I want a reward or do I not? Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> Right? You might think, well, I'm not going to get any reward on the earth. Why are you comparing earthly rewards with heavenly rewards? <laughs> heavenly rewards, I think, are going to be a lot better. I don't think that's an opinion either. I think that's just the truth. <laughs> All right. Almost done. We'll be done by 12.15 today. Guarantee it. So how do, we, how do we steward this gift? How do we manage the finances of God? Peter tells us right here in verse 10, as each believer has received extraordinary powers, employ it in serving one another as good stewards. How do you steward the finances of God? 
How do you steward the gifts of the Spirit? In serving one another. That's how I do it, right there. So my questions at the beginning of, do you have something to offer the church? Do you have something inside of you that can benefit those around you? If you do, is it benefiting them? Is it still benefiting them? Is it still serving the church? Is it still blessing the church? It could be something like hospitality. That is a gift. I think everyone should be hospitable, but some people are a lot better at it than others. But if it's on your heart to be hospitable, are you doing that? If you have a gift of prayer, are you praying? I'm just... We, we need to be asking ourselves these things because this is how we properly steward the gifts of God, the gifts of the Spirit. This is how we properly steward them. And it is in taking care of and serving each other. That comes first. Let's take care of things at home. Let's make sure things are at home are okay. And then we, we can go out there and take care of them. Now, it doesn't mean we... Do it step by step. I just We need to be thinking about each other a lot. We need to be thinking about each other daily. And I, something I try to do, as long as Reagan doesn't interrupt my thought process, something I try to do is as soon as I think about somebody, I at least send them a text message. As soon as I think about them. And that right there is service. It's enough. So even if it's just that, I'm, I'm just thinking about you, you know. So how do we steward the gifts? How do we steward the extraordinary powers? We employ it in serving one another. Now look at this last part. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The manifold grace of God. Okay. We were talking about gifts, and now we're talking about grace. We were talking about talking about stewarding gifts, and now we're talking about stewarding grace. So which is it? Like what's going on here? Now, first of all, when it says the manifold grace of God, manifold means diverse, and this is where we get all the different kinds of gifts. It means diverse. It means multifaceted. This is where we get all the kinds of gifts. But I want to look at a different passage of Scripture just real quick that I believe can help explain what this means when it says that we are good stewards or we are to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. All right, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I want to read 6 through 8 here. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Now, before this, Paul talks about each member of the body of Christ. We're still talking about every believer. But starting with verse 6 here, he says, Since we have gifts, everyone say, I have extraordinary powers. You don't sound, I have <laughs> extraordinary powers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Again, I want to argue the point that you only have one gift. Because this mentions many gifts here. There are many different gifts that it mentions here. Not all of them, but many gifts are mentioned here, and most of them, if not all of them, are supposed to be done by everybody. You can say, well, I don't have the gift of mercy, so forget you. <laughs> now, I don't have the gift of giving, so I don't have to give today. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, 
I, I want to argue the point that, that some theology makes, and that is that God only gave me one gift. And if it's not my gift, I don't got to do it. Stop badgering me about it. I don't have to give it. You know, somebody gets up and says, we're going to give in the tithes and offerings now. And somebody's like, well, that's not my gift. So you're not getting anything from me, God. Right? Somebody comes up to you on the street and says, I need prayer. My back hurts. Can you pray that God would heal it? That's not my gift. Go find somebody. Here, let me come to my church. There's bound to be somebody there that can. <laughs> this is just how ridiculous that sounds. I want to argue that point because if God is in you, a multifaceted, manifold God is within me, then there is something diverse happening inside of me. And at a moment's notice, that thing can come out of me. And I may not even know it's in there. It was in there to begin with because God goes way beyond this little tiny piece of meat up here. He goes way beyond it. He's so much bigger than that. But look at this. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. How many of you were given grace? All right. If you are a believer, you were given grace. You have to be because you're saved by what? Grace. Okay. If you're saved, you have grace. You've been given grace. With this free gift of grace comes an expensive calling God is not requiring it. He's not saying, you better do this or you're, you know, I, I don't believe that. It's, it's not, you're condemned forever if you don't do this. At the same time, at the same time, someone has to pay for that thing. Jesus paid for this gift that he gave me, the gift of grace. I've been given it for free, but it's an expensive calling because in that free gift, in that free gift is a lifetime of responsibility. I am to steward this gift, not just sit on it. God tells me over and over and over in his word that this that is put inside of me is here, that I might steward it, that I might manage it, not just let it sit there. So what one thing we have to remember is that what God gave us doesn't belong to us. If he calls us stewards, we're just managers. I don't own what he gave me. I'm just borrowing it for a bit. Because I can't own God. And that's ultimately the source of all of these gifts inside of me. But I can manage what he does through me. I can. I can't control God. But... I can open the door. I can't tell God, you move right now. But I can say, here's the door's open, God. If you want to move, go for it. I'm open. I've got, you're given the opportunity. We are called. We are, we are bound to a course of active service to Christ because we are bound to Christ. We are bound to a course of active service to Christ because we are bound to Christ. Grace is inseparable from surrender to Christ because it is required for salvation. If grace is within me, then I am called to steward it. We are called to be stewards of God's grace, and what he tells us here is that we steward his grace by allowing his spirit to work in and through us by serving one another. All right. It's the same thing as like if you've been forgiven, which... We all have, right? If I've been forgiven, I steward that forgiveness by forgiving others. I give it away. I've been given grace. I give it away. Grace is not just unmerited favor and that be like, you're okay, you're a cool person. Not that kind of grace. Yes, that kind of grace. But grace comes in the form of God lives within me because of grace. And he wants to come out. He wants to come out in a manifold way. He wants to manifest himself in a manifold way. So if you came in this morning feeling like, I do have something, I don't know what it is, just open the door and let God do it. Also, read in the Word. There's so many examples of things that I can do. Things, And you, we can't look at something like serving. Well, that's not my gift. And go, 
Since it's not my gift, I'm I'm not going to do it. No, you've been called to serve. You've been called to prophesy. You've been called to teach. You've been called to heal. Every single one of us have been called to do all of these things. And we have the power to be able to do it because of who lives inside of us. Right? He lives inside of us. He can do these things. All I need to do is say, God, I'm willing. I'm ready. Whatever you want to do, do it through me. I'm open. Whoever's standing in front of me, whatever their problem may be, whatever situation I may be facing, I have the equipment inside of me to be able to take care of it. It's called the Spirit of God. It's called Father God. It's called Jesus Christ. They're all right here inside of me. And that power is just waiting to come out and change the world around me. So can, can I encourage us in here this morning to build each other up by serving each other in that way, to steward the grace of God by serving one another. If you see a hole in the body of Christ, don't wait for somebody to, for somebody else to fill it. If you see a need in the body of Christ, don't wait for somebody else to, to meet that need. Do it. Go for it. If you feel like somebody needs to be checked on, check on them. We can do that. And I promise you, if we're all doing this every day of our lives, every moment that we even think about it, then we will have one of the most thriving bodies that the world has ever seen. And it doesn't even mean that we'll have a church of 5,000 people. We could have a church of 50 people and still be the most living body on the face of the earth. It just comes down to, am I stewarding what God put inside of me? Amen? All right. Why don't you go ahead and stand with me? I'm just going to say a quick prayer and we're going to be we're going to be out of here. Father, thank you for being yourself in our hearts and in our lives and in our spirit. Thank you for making your home in us. I I pray that you would awaken the gifts of the spirit in this body, in Living Word Church, every person in this room, Lord. They would be awakened and stirred and even hungry to see those things come alive in us and to influence each other around us, that that this whole body would be blessed and benefited and encouraged and edified because every single person is stepping up to the plate saying, I'm ready to be used. I'm ready to speak. I'm ready to teach. I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to prophesy. I'm ready to heal. I'm ready to encourage. I'm ready to let in. I'm ready to let out that every single one of us would be ready to take on the responsibility that you have set in front of us and that we would be good stewards of the grace that you've given us in salvation. I pray that and I speak that over every person in this house. May may nothing, may nothing put out that fire in the name of Jesus. Just stir it up even in yourself now. Even if you're in yourself now, stir that thing up. Tell it it's time to come alive. It's time to manifest itself. Dreams of the past, gifts that you've buried, it's time to unbury them. It's time for those dreams to come alive. Whatever God has put inside of you, it's not over yet. I speak that over you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, nothing will come against that. Amen. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.